What can a leader of a boat teach us about how to make better teams, whether we're official managers or not? That's what we're going to talk about today. A true leader has confidence to stand alone, the courage to make tough decisions, and the compassion to listen to the needs of others. He does not set out to be a leader, but becomes one by the equality of his actions and the integrity of his intent. Douglas MacArthur. Today, we're going to review the book, It's Your Ship, Management Techniques from the Best Damn Ship in the Navy. Hope that doesn't lose me my nice, clean rating, but he said it first, so. The author is Captain D. Michael Abershoff. He was the commander of the USS Benfold. It's interesting to read military people. I'm interested in military people because on one hand, they have a very strict process about how to do almost everything. But how do you spur leadership on when there are so many rules in place, when there's so many expectations you have to have? And he comes up with some interesting balances. But we're going to review his book and talk a little bit about what he talks about bringing people to full potential. Military is known, at least maybe in a bad reputation, not listening to the lower ranks, not listening to people who might have really good ideas but don't have stars and stripes on their <laughs> shoulders as officers. And what I found with my experience, so I grew up in the military, my dad was in the Air Force, and we would talk about it a lot of times about the military and how it's structured. And there were some bad things for sure, but I also learned some valuable lessons. Like when my dad would talk about racism, he was like, we need everybody. When you're in the military, every person there has your back. You need every talent and skill from every kind of person. You need everybody. And the military makes that happen. I, that's great. That's admirable. And so I have a lot of respect for the military, people in the military, and I'm a kid of a military person, so I do respect that quite a bit. He says that basically leaders all start out with a goal. Just like every business starts out with a goal, every person starts out with a goal. But what leadership can do is to help people realize that full potential. And he says it's about performance over ego. And his overall philosophy is to give up control so that people would have more ownership because in the end, it was their ship too. He was the commander of it, but they had to become experts in running it and have enough independence where they could look for things that were going wrong, come up with great ideas of how to make them better. And he says, as a leader, it was his responsibility to see the ship through their eyes. The person who ran the ship before he ran the ship was not very well liked. And in fact, he said that when that person retired, people cheered. And so it suddenly struck him, wow, I must do a better job. I must have better self-awareness about what's going on. He realized at some point that your goals as a leader is to be trusted and to work really hard. And it's not to be liked. I've seen that. You know, I used to be a team lead for a support company that did support for Windows 95 and other products that were out there. And there were people, there were managers who tried to be liked and their teams did horribly. They wanted to be the friend boss. The person has fun. The person who, ah, you know what, if you need to take it off, just we won't say anything, right? That, that great old boss that you have that does all the right things and breaks all the rules for you. They didn't do very well. Then there were other bosses that were downright mean, almost cruel, and they ran a tight ship and every I had to be dotted and everything had to be in its order. There was no room for compassion because they had a mission to get done. And sometimes their statistics were very good, but they had a lot of loss in staffing. People quit quite frequently. Their staff members never got promoted, never became other things. And when it came time to do other special projects, they were not interested because they were being run into the ground on their day-to-day -day jobs. And so they weren't employees at this point. They were just fearing for their paycheck. And so when I see a book like this, I'm interested in that balance between rules, morale, growing people, making people independent, but also getting the jobs done. So he said that he had to start taking chances, come up with new ideas. And that he took the opportunity with the ship that was already a bad morale ship. People quit left and right. And it had the reputation of just being a poor functioning ship. And he said this was an opportunity and he wasn't going to squander it or anything like that. A real leader has to learn how to make their people 
have the ability to do their jobs. And then also to think like your own boss so that you know what their goals are too. He indicates also that you have to learn from your mistakes and move on from both of them. You know, I think if you dwell too much in your past successes or you dwell too much in your past mistakes, you don't go anywhere. And so he wanted to turn this ship around and he did so. I Spoiler alert, he totally did. But he said that first thing is, is that when you're managing your own boss, you want to know exactly what they're thinking about, what they're worried about, and take that on so that your boss doesn't have to work out a thing that you, he says, quote, lift their burdens. And so they trust you. Once they trust you, they give you more freedoms to try other things. If they're constantly worried what kind of thing you're doing over there, they're not going to give you much of a room to wiggle on any sort of rules. You have to really get into what he says the boss's head and anticipate what it is that they're trying to get done. Once you understand what the boss is trying to get done, then, first of all, you can make them look great, which they all love. All bosses love to look great. But it also looks towards the actual goals that they have. Sometimes you may not do what the boss told you to do, but you gain the goal anyway because you thought something outside the box. And so he says his first analysis when looking at a ship is, what's going wrong here? So he analyzed what's going on Are they not given enough training to get their job done? Are they not given enough time? Do they not know what the goals are? And how can they turn it around? So he says the first thing is, is that he's had to check his own ego. He always had to remember there's no retribution. You had to match your tasks with the right people. And you might think, oh, gosh, another work thing. But, you know, this is true in anything. But he says then you have to listen offer suggestions. And in the end, when it comes to the rules or it comes to his boss, at all costs, he has to obey, even when you disagree. It's a good piece of advice. So he realized that in order to lead a ship properly, everyone has to have a piece of ownership in that ship. They have to feel like they're a part of something. If they feel like just some low-wage worker, even in the military, who is at the bottom rung, do your job, shut up, they're, they're not going to be doing the best job they possibly could. He said that you never pit people against each other. You have to give them credit where credit is due, that you have to not whine about small things that happen, you know, as a boss or even as an employee. So many small things happen. I remember even in my company, the last company I was in, sometimes something very minuscule will happen and people would lament to the boss that it was like the end of the world. There's a lot of really rotten companies out there. Let's put this into perspective. But in the end, he said that when you're a good leader, you should be brave. You should say and do the right things and realize that at the root, the whole organization is the people. He says that bad bosses will not listen, not give credit, that they are ignoring the top, they're ignoring the bottom, and they're just listening to their own egos says that we have to be brave and listen to both sides, and then we'll talk about what we should do next. He says there's some sort of social contract in place, and I think that's true when it comes to a company. When I started in my last job in the company, I was the 36th employee. This was a tech startup. It was my very first tech startup, and it was exciting. We had great days where we had huge excess, and then we had Big days where we lost giant contracts and I didn't know if half of us would have a job the next day. It was something what I used to call like being in a speedboat. You didn't know where you were going next. The head of the company was in the top of the speedboat and we were just zigzagging left and right. It was crazy to be in a tech startup. I loved it, but I understood this could not be for everybody because you have to be able to be agile. And I think that whether you're in a small speedboat or in this United States fleet ship, you know, a gigantic ship, you have to have a proper sense of leadership to do that. So the first thing he says is that you have to make sure that you have no regrets, that you're dedicated to constantly learning. I think that was true for me too. When it came time for my job, not only did I have to become the trainer, the support person, the business analyst for the upgrades, the everything, writer, tester, you name it. 
I also had to order the chairs. And one of those chairs is in my downstairs office when they gave it away because it was my first thing that I ever did for that company. You learn to do everything. But I think as a boss, you have to be dedicated to continual learning. But he says that you also have to have no regrets as an attitude. Give yourself and your people freedom to fail. It's important that people know they can try things. It's okay if they fail. It's okay if it doesn't quite work out. You tried something really new and innovative. It didn't work this time. That's okay. Once people feel that you believe that it's okay to fail, suddenly things will get more creative. And that's where he's saying here. And he said that you have to realize what your boss's motivations are. Your boss is interested always, whether you're in the military or you're in private organizations, saving money, boosting morale in free ways. <laughs> so you want to make sure that people are happy, but sometimes happiness costs. And so can you make people happy without breaking your budget? And then you start teaching people that are on your team that it's okay to take risks. You give a ton of credit when they do and it works out. And you give a ton of credit when they do and it doesn't work out. So either way, you're trying to prevent anyone from becoming a parrot, he says, because you just sit there and if you just bark orders at people, they don't become leaders. They don't become owners of the area that they're in charge of. They just do what they're told and then they stop. And then they do the next thing you tell them and they stop. I remember there was someone that had a team. And it was sort of interesting when I was watching him because he was my first team lead in that other company. It was like everybody had to have a quarter put in them. They would do exactly what the boss told us to do, but then they never went any further. And I'm like, it's like you're a vending machine and, and get, in order to get you to do anything, there has to be another quarter in you. Why is that? And what he's saying is you get that way when you don't allow people to take ownership of their projects. You don't give them a corner of their own world and let them try things. They are just order takers and you're just an order giver. And I think in the military, there's quite a bit of that, but he decided he didn't want to be that. He says that sometimes you have to spend money despite the fact that you do have a budget in order to do things. We'll talk later in the podcast about some of the ways he spent money. You have to look for promising sailors and really start working on them. Give them chances, even if he said they were low level. Sometimes he would see someone who was very sharp, and he would give them that ability to step outside and do something amazing, you know, really show people. He also says that sometimes you have to know when to break the rules. SOPs, Standard Operating Procedure, big part of military, right? There are manuals and manuals and manuals about how to do everything. But those manuals are there to produce a positive outcome, but not an awesome outcome, not an amazing outcome, not in a huge improvement. And so sometimes you have to know when to break out of those SOPs in order to do that. And then he says, you look for the win-wins. You know, he had situations where they were going out to certain locations in the boat and he allowed shore leave when shore leave was typically not allowed because it was a free way to boost morale. The team got to see places in the world they've never been to. And it was just a free way of making people happy. And then he said that you praise a lot, that you, you celebrate all the things that they're doing, but that you never tear down your people or you never tear the bosses down either. Oh, you know, that guy, he's so terrible. You know, he's making this all awful for you. You can't do that either. He says that when you give that kind of warmth, that kind of praise, that kind of attention to people, he said that it heals relationships, it builds people up, it gives them more confidence. And he says, quote, coldness congeals. So as soon as you start with that cold, brutal attitude towards people, it chills their own enthusiasm for the job at all. Another thing is you thank someone warmly for the great job they did, and then you ignore them afterwards. That, you know, maybe someone gets a medal because they did this outstanding thing, and you see them in the hallway, and then the boss never pays attention to you, never says a hi or anything to you. When I joined that tech startup, there could be many things positive and negative about being in a tech start startup, but the owner of that company knew every one of us, knew all our stories, talked to us like we were human beings. I remember walking around during one of our company parties and we were just sort of looking at the boats that were on the shore that were near our company um, picnic. 
And he said, you know, someday I would just like to be able to buy one of these. But until I can get this company to a place where I don't have to mortgage my house every time we're short on payroll, I'll never get there. I got to see into his heart a little bit that every time there's not enough money in the coffers to pay our paycheck or to pay a bill, he borrows the money against his house. And so he has dreams too. He's a tech startup guy. He's one of like what you imagine tech startup people are, crazy energy, never sleeps, always going and going, but he has dreams. And we got to know him. And when he gave us an award or he gave us an appreciation, he would remember it. And he would talk to us in the halls. He would talk to us in the lunchroom. And that is so important. I've been in companies where the bosses would see you. I used to do the computer support for an owner of one of those companies. And I joined it when I was the 360th employee. When I left, there were 8,000 employees. I've been to her house. I petted her dog. You know, I've met her children. And every time I'd run into her in the hallway, she would act as if she never met me before. It just was her style. And I think her head was a thousand feet away, but it doesn't make you feel warm and it doesn't make you feel as if you're part of something. So he says that you really have to start nurturing, enabling, focusing on your people and making them at the core of what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. He says that he always started out when new employees came aboard the ship or new recruits in his case, having a fantastic introduction, meaning they meet everybody, they get shown around the ship, someone goes around and teaches them all the tricks about how to do everything along the ship, how to get hot water out of the spigot and where's the best place to sit and all those things. They appreciate it because now they feel like they're a part of something. And then the next step is when you're looking at your team to try to create what he calls a deep bench. I liked his viewpoint on trying to get everyone to improve, having them build their career in ways that they want to build their career. If someone wants to be a fantastic mechanic, help them get to be a fantastic mechanic. If this person is headed towards leadership and wants to run their own boat someday, help them get there too. But start helping them see promotions and seeing what the criteria is for their job. What's expected of them? What are they supposed to do? Where are they even deficient in what they do? They will appreciate it. You know, so many times I think today, People don't want to tell people how to improve in their job. And so then they never improve. You know, I see people who didn't talk very nicely to customers and no one ever sat down and talked to them as their bosses to say, you know, you could be a little nicer to customers. And you know what? That means they never got nicer to customers because no one ever came to them and said, hey, by the way, you're not the warmest person in the world. If you want to help them improve, that you also have to show them where they're stuck. And where they could overcome some thing they have, we all have them, and make sure that they get better. And then he says, in the end, you have to have some sort of line in the sand when it comes to behaviors. You know, he calls it a backstop. But he said that, you know, don't go around threatening that you're going to do something if you're not going to do it. If there's a, a, a line you cannot cross in this job, in your family, in any of these things, you have to act upon it. You know, you see that with families and kids, right? If you throw that toy one more time and then the kid throws the toy and then nothing happens, what do you think the lesson is there? Same thing with people too. So he'll go through and start finding people he can work with and prove to them how they can be a part of this and giving them ownership over entire areas. He made them own the area that they were in charge of. If you think about Star Trek, which I think about Star Trek a lot, you know, Scotty owned engineering. Sulu owned the helm. The doctor owned his medical client. I mean, it wasn't the captain going around and barking orders at everyone. He expected each of those people to be leaders of their division. So he expected to start building the skills. He wanted them to run the ship. And he gave them a rule that said, unless it was going to cause a lot of money, cause damage to the ship, cause damage to another person, I think, then he didn't want to know about it. He wanted them to work out their own solutions, figure out how to best run their area. It's risky, I think, for sure, but it paid off because this very low morale ship turned around and turned into a great place to be. He had more leadership promotions. 
He had more people growing in their positions at every opportunity he could to get them classes, to get them something they wanted to learn. He was there to do it. And part of it, too, is he had some bad eggs and there was some racial issue that happened. And he saw some of the statistics about, you know, videos and course correction programs for people who displayed racism. And it didn't work out well. The people who were involved in the situation never really improved. They maybe learned the right language to say or the right thing to do so they don't get in trouble, but he wanted something more. So he went to a specific situation that he had, and he instead talked to them about the benefit of community. That thing that I said my dad was talking about, you have each other's backs. We're not pointing fingers. We're not going to sit there and do anything against our fellow shipmate. We need everybody on this ship and we need everyone to do their job and to feel a part of their job and to feel a part of the community. And he strengthened that effort. There were some reprimands going in there, but it wasn't that official response that people get. And those people walked away from their bad behavior and became brothers. That's the important part. You're trying to fix a situation. You're just not trying to check off boxes to get yourself out of a bad situation. And then he thought of other places, too, where he could build community. He spent more money on food because the military had to, at that time, follow the same requisition forms that they have to follow when they're ordering a part for the ship for the food on the ship. And so their peanut butter was terrible, just as an example. He got them skippy peanut butter and made sure they found out if they like chunky or smooth. But he got them the food that they wanted. It was a minor increase in spending. But when you're out on a ship and you're serving in the military and training you is a huge expense, a can of Skippy is probably the best dollar saved if it just makes their lives a little bit better. But then he did other things, too. He, you know, had barbecues. He carried around this gigantic cache of booze, which everyone got super mad about because we do not have booze on the ship. And he's like, I'm not drinking booze on the ship. But the first chance I have an opportunity to have some sort of a beach party, we're going to do it. And he always was looking out to make sure that they had a chance to do something fun and to have that community. When they had chances to get satellite entertainment, he was the first one to push for his ship to get it. You know what? It worked. In the end, his ship turned around. It became one of the best ships in the fleet. And at the time, when we were at war with Iraq, there were new things that needed to get put on ships. And because his ship formed so amazingly well, like least to best in a short period of time, he got some of the best equipment and some of the most important tasks. He says in the end, he could have been a little bit easier on other leaders because as soon as other boats saw like he was having barbecues on the beach or going out on shore leave when they couldn't go on on shore leave, it caused animosity in those other ships. Well, You can't do that because if you do that, my people will see that and then they will want to do that. And his opinion at the time was like, good, then go do that. Go do those nice things for people. But you also have to realize that every ship commander has their own situation. He could have talked people into it instead of building animosity. He felt that he was probably a bit arrogant in his own belief in his own system. He realized that it made it hard for other commanders. He could have done more to build bridges instead of making them look bad or making them angry. But in the end, he felt his job was as a talent cultivator and it worked for him. I like this book overall because I think it was about, like I said, being in this situation where you're limited in what you could do. And how do you break out of some of the rules or how do you break out some of the strictness the military has? and give people that opportunity to become something more. I like that. The question I had, and I wish there was a little bit more time on it, had to do with, I, you know, as a manager, I had a team of 60 people that I supervised. And some people, I was that person who was the talent cultivator. I looked for those people on my team that showed promise. Even if they behaved badly, I would see that as maybe pent up energy that wasn't being directed in the right direction. Could I give that person a project they would really enjoy and thrive at doing? I had one guy, he wanted to be a programmer. He thought this job was below him. And so he acted poorly all the time. You know what I did? I gave him programming jobs to help us come up with tools for our team. He thrived at that. 
and then I helped him get certified in programming languages and other methods because he didn't go to college. So he felt always impaired in his job. And I found him ways to get certified so that he would be as good as college. And he always appreciated that. And he eventually moved on to something better. But I looked for talent and I looked for potential. I hoped I did it like this guy did. But there were some people on my team. They just wanted to be troublemakers. They were playing video games on my team. And the funny thing about it is they didn't know I was one of the programmers on one of those video games. And on weekends, I would see them in that game during their work hours. And so I created a special room that would summon them to that room so they couldn't do anything. And they got really mad at me once they found out the trick. There were some just bad eggs. What do you do about the people who just won't get along or just won't build community? I was kind of interested. Does his system work in every situation? Or did he just come up with a ship that just wanted to do better? All right. So my challenge to you is think about a way that you can find the people in your life. One, look for those people who have that real urge to do better, whether it's your kids, whether it's your teammates, and figure out a small plan of where you could help them go someplace they want to go that would improve their lives, improve the quality of their happiness, and try to grow their talent. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. This Thursday, I'm starting a brand new podcast that is called Buzz, Blossom, and Squeak. I wish it had small steps in it, but the whole thing is finding nature out your front door, whether it's rocks, weather, stars, auroras, animals, birds, lizards. I want to help you find them. And we're going to just talk about simple ways discovering and learning more about nature. So that's going to start Thursday, Buzz Blossom and Squeak. And I'll talk a little bit more about it next week, hopefully when it goes live. And remember, our steps across our ship with all our people starts with small steps, arm in arm.